Okay, so be prepared. I have lots of windows open and I am going to share my screen. And I want to ask first of all, this is, this is something that I stay awake at night thinking about. Uh, in the game of four-dimensional tic-tac-toe, is it possible to have a tie game? Anybody tackle that? Glauco? Yes, I, and, I have one. <laughs> Adam, wow, I am impressed. I am impressed. Uh, first, let me ask Adam, how did you do it? Did you do it by brute strength or? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I, I looked at how you did it for the three-dimensional case in the book. Yes. And um, I did my best to approximate that into four dimensions and then solve the issues I found with it. And that worked. Glauco, did you do about the same? Uh, I get with one, uh, with one or two ideas and it worked. Wow. Suddenly. <laughs> so you, you prove that there is tie games in the game of four-dimensional tic-tac-toe. Okay, you know what problem this leaves open? Are there any ties in five-dimensional tic-tac-toe? Uh, well, uh, does one of you have a, a, a tie game that you could share on your screen? Uh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. I think you have to oh, stop. I, I, I do have to stop, and I do have to give you permission. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's see. <laughs> okay, extra credit for a 4.0 in the course. Can anybody see a game that is one year? I see a winning game, Adam. Me too. Where did I miss a direction you can win in? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So look at the second column from the left, from top to bottom. Sec no, second column. Yes, right there. And go diagonal. Top square, second square, third square, fourth square, fifth square. Uh, I didn't think you could win that way, but yep, that would do it. That'd do it in every column, actually. Oh, okay, okay. Well, of course you could win to that way because that those five uh, squares going down are a three-dimensional cube, right? All right, well, yep, I was wrong. <laughs> okay, well, but I, I'm really impressed that you tried it. Okay, Glauco, we're going we're gonna to stomp on your ego next. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and share what you have. Oh, come on. I'm sorry, I'm not convinced. Oh, so I'm mute. Gla is Glauco muted? Uh, sorry, uh, I have uh, two kind of squares. Yes. Uh, one of, are with a circle and others with a big X and they correspond to this in the right. Uh, yeah. The circle is all circles except for one X here in the corner and four X's here and another four here. Okay. And, the, and the X square is the same, but the inverse. So one little circle, all X, X's and then four circles and four circles. And then in the middle, you can plug in whatever you want that is without a winning combination. And this should work because uh, you see here in the upper line, you have um, all our circles, but there is one X in the middle. Okay. Then here, there are two circles and three X. Here is the same pattern. And here there are two circles and two X. And here two X and two circles. Okay. So if you go from an X to the next, you have a circle. Um, and um, I tell you, I tell you, Glauco, I, I'm yeah. not saying that you're wrong, but it's hard for me to see that you're right. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I will. I, I, yeah, I if, will. You, if you could put it on a grid like Adam so that we can, uh, we can pop your ego also. Um. I will do it for next time. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Maybe next week. <laughs> okay. I, I would like to see that. I would okay. like to see that. Okay. Thank you.
go ahead and unshare your screen. So Adam, do you think you can you can uh, you can tune yours to not work, or do you think or you want to give up? It would be a significant change in the methodology, but I I, I think you can still find it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? Well, okay. Give it a try. I, I'm very impressed. If if you get an answer, I will put this on the um, Handbook of Fourier Analysis webpage and make sure that you get full credit. I'll put a little picture in your bio and everything. No, I won't put your bio. I just I, I'll just give you appropriate credit, I guess. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk more about the homework. Where'd you go? Ah, here we go. Let's see. Um, okay, derive the two-dimensional Fourier series of a circle of uh, unit uh, radius when the circles are touching and arranged rectangularly, and circles are touching and arranged hexagonally. Does any Anybody want to try this? I don't suppose so. So let me call on somebody. And uh, what do they say? There will always be prayer in public school as long as as long as there's tests, right? So let's go to um, let's go, David. David, you're zero. And the reason David is always zero, he always logs in first, so he's at the top. So it's uh, zero for David, one for Adam, two for Aiden, three for Glauco, four for Chris, and five for Justin. And am I forgetting anybody here? I don't believe so. Who are we, who are we missing here? That, I think that's everyone. You started at zero, so that's six people. Oh, you're right, you're right. I started counting at zero. Okay, yes. Boy, that's an amateur, right? For somebody that codes in C, I should know better, right? Doesn't C always start its indexing at zero? Yeah, okay. Uh, tails, tails, tails. David, if you didn't get it or, or you're not proud of your answer, just say, I didn't get it or I'm not proud of my answer. Uh, I not proud of my answer. Okay. Let's try one more time. Uh, tails, heads, heads. Three. That's you, Aiden. I was I was told I was two. Yeah, I'm I'm three. Oh, I'm three. I, is it zero, one, two. You changed in order. Okay. Okay. Glauco. Should I go or should I say, <laughs> do I have the option to, to skip? <laughs> well, you have the option to skip by saying, I didn't get it or I'm not proud of my answer. Yeah, I'm not proud of my answer. Okay. So let's go to the point where anybody is proud or semi-proud of their answer. Adam. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'm all uh, right with my answer. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we're looking to you to redeem yourself, so this is good. <laughs> Got to make up for the tic-tac-toe fiasco. <laughs> That's right. The big scandal of 2020, huh? Okay. All right. So, yes. So, starting with uh, arranged rectangularly, I guess I assume they were arranged in squares, not rectangles. Um, unit squares, to be precise. Um, so that would be our P matrix. Q is P inverse transpose, one half, one half. Q times M becomes M one over two, M two over two. So then to define our um, tile, I suppose, we have the tile itself, which is just two vect functions making the square. And then we subtract our circle out of it, of just unit radius. Okay, uh, so you're assuming holes in the donuts, donut. The dough, right? 
Yes. It, okay, it did that's not fine. specify, so that's what I went with. <laughs> okay. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I, I just said circles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so then Fourier transform this, and you get uh, this lovely equation here. We get your square becomes sink sink, and your circle becomes a jink, uh, as we would expect. So then we got to turn that into our coefficients. So we multiply by the determinant of Q, which is one fourth here. Uh, and then we plug in for QM and for where our T's were here. Um, so the twos cancel with the one half. So you just get sync M1, sync M2, and you plug in in the jink and they stick around. And then, so for the final term, it's the summation with coefficients and the exponential of the QM times U transpose. And it turns into that. Okay, great. Now that's perfect. Good. And then the hexagon one is uh, pretty much the same, but you have a different um, P matrix here, um, which changes your Q matrix as well. But it's the same setup with the tiling. Um, it's the same. Oh, wait, no, did I mess this up? Yep, I yes. think you did. You didn't yeah, mess it up. Tiles aren't square anymore. Yep, yep, I messed it up. <laughs> okay. So what should you have done there? How did you mess it up? I think your second equation is wrong, right? Yeah. No, your second equation is right. It's the third equation that's wrong. If the second one's right, the third one's right. It'd be the, this one that'd be wrong. Yes, yes. Oh, no, that, wait, why is that wrong? So wait, this is wrong if, because all our tiles now hexagon shaped or square shaped? Oh no, they're hexagon shaped now. Because that, oh, no, yeah, no, that no. changes this term. Okay. Here's the thing though, they can be hexagon they can let's see, can they be square shaped? Yeah, I believe they can be square shaped. They can be? I don't know. What do you think? I think I didn't I don't know. They, they they can be they can be square they can be rectangularly shaped, but you don't get that pretty result. Yeah. Remember, for for any uh, any periodically um, periodically replicated signal, you have a number of tiles which are applicable. One of the tiles that's always applicable is the parallelogram, which you get by uh, completing the periodicity vectors right into a parallelogram. That's always a tile, and you can also get this as this hexagonal this hexagonal sample you can get a tile as in the case of laying brick, right? If you look at my picture, you lay a brick here, you lay a brick here, and then right on top of it, you lay two other bricks, which are out of phase with the bricks below. However, those bricks are not square anymore, number one. And number two, those bricks are probably going to cut into the circles. And so you have to, if you're using that, you have to do something weird. So uh, you can use a rectangular, does everybody, probably my, my picture isn't that good. Um, one thing, um, yeah, would, the circles still, would the circles still be touching rectangles? Oh yeah, they still would be, they still would be touching, but what would happen, well, let me uh, un unshare your screen here and I'll see if I have the ability to, uh, to draw here. So I'm, I'm guessing what we're looking at is, we can choose between squares and circles, but we can't uh, have both in the equations. No, you can, but here's the problem, okay. Man, my days of drawing good circles are over, gentlemen. They all look like eggs, which are dropped into skillet from an elevation of five or six feet. Okay. Still. Uh, yeah, here, here is the point, okay. Okay, uh, clearly we could choose, there, there's a bunch of different, um, bunch of different periodicity vectors that we could use. One is this one. 
correct? That's the hexagonal one. But the other one is this one. Don't, don't forget, in order to get the periodicity vectors, you have to go from the center of one period to the center of another period. Is that okay? Center of one period to the center of another period. Uh, what about using this period? And um, let's see. Yeah. Let's see, can we use this one? I'm trying to get the second one uh, as a rectangle. I know I can do it, except it isn't, it isn't, uh, it isn't working out here. Here's another attempt to do this. My geometry is failing me right now. Say you have a hexa hexagonal replication like this, right? You can use tiles that look like this. This is the brick sort of thing that I was talking about, right? So, but I think the, the thing Justin was pointing out is you can't have a circle inside that rectangle exactly. that is touching the circle next to it. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. So what happens if you do this, if you do this, you're going to have, and I, I'm sorry, I just can't draw it for some reason. You're going to have, you're going to have a brick and in that brick, you're going to have, um, you're going to have pieces of the circle over here and over here. And uh, you're going to have pieces of the circle within the brick. The exact geometry escapes me right now. But do you see that? You don't have to have the circle totally subsumed into the tile in order to lay a bunch of rectangular tiles and get this hexagonal, hexagonal um, replication. Rather, you should be able to lay these bricks. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I if I was smart, what I would do here. Okay, it's escaping me right now. But the point is, and I should probably elaborate on this for some homework, that the rectangular tile that you is going to have is not going to totally include uh, the circle, is it? Right? That you're going to have little pieces out here. That's okay, but it makes the Fourier transform within a tile really difficult. Because to transform that with part of the circle in the tile and part of it kind of touching the edges and stuff is going to be very difficult. So you could do it with a rectangle, but it would not be as pretty. So sorry, I couldn't give you a better artistic interpretation of that. Dr. Marks, I have a question. Yes. So I think I've been kind of confused about the tiles um, because I thought like when you're, when you're making your vectors, your period, your period, periodicity, 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 there you go. Periodicity vectors. I kind of thought that the tile had to be like defined by those, but is that, is that, that's not necessarily the case. Is it? The only thing that the periodicity vectors uh, require is that the area of all the tiles is exactly the same. Okay. So what exactly is the relationship between the periodicity of vectors and the tiles? Because I, I kind of thought that you just, you did had two vectors and then that became like two edges of the tile basically. But is that not always the case? Yes, if you have two periodicity vectors, say P sub one and P sub two, and you increase this, then this parallelogram can always be a tile, always. So are, are there some cases where you could just connect the two and make a triangle and that could be a tile in certain cases? No, you can't get a triangle because the idea of a tile is, one of the rules of a tile is there's no rotation. Okay. And in so, order, yeah, and, and, in order to, for a triangle to work, you'd have to rotate. Then? You'd have to rotate it, right. Yeah, okay. 
Got it. I just published a paper last year on doing that, by the way. And it's, uh, it's an interesting paper. If we had more time, I'd go over it. But um, yeah. So it, it, here's the point. So this would be a, uh, a potential periodicity vector, right? And you would have to have a tile centered on each of these points. But my point is, is that you can also make a, a rectangle here. See this brick? That's a brick and I can make another brick right here. And I can make another brick right here. And my brick on top of it is out of phase with it. So I'm kind of like laying bricks. And those rectangular geometry could also be a tile. It could also be a tile. Uh, but the question is, when you go to the store and you buy a tile, you can get a number of different shapes that would tile your bathroom, and you would get exactly the same pattern. Like, I don't care what a period was here, you could probably put that period on a rectangular tile, or you could put it on a parallelogram tile. It's just that the tiles would look different, wouldn't they? But in both cases, you could, uh, you could tile your bathroom, and the results would be exactly, exactly the same. We went over this a little bit. Okay, you're probably not seeing my screen here, right? So. Let's see, I'm trying to think when this was. I don't have these. Let's see if it was this one. No, that was this. So it was after this, what is this one? This is 8C. So we probably want 8D, there it is. Nope, we want 8E. Yeah, here we go. Here, for example, is uh, this cross. Here's P1 and P2. And so, yes, we could come up here to P1 and P2. We could complete the parallelogram, and we could get this tile. Now, notice the structure inside the tile. On the upper left, we would have what? We would have the bottom of the cross and the right section of the cross over here. We would have the left section of the cross down here in the parallelogram. We would have this part of the cross and this part of the cross, right? So that cross would be chopped up into different sections on the parallelogram, correct? The other point is, is that we could, instead of this, use this rectangular, rectangular coordinate And the cross would be at the center of each one of the tiles, wouldn't it? So the point is, we could go to the store and we could buy this tile with this kind of curious result, curious uh, pattern of having this cross split up in the four different corners of the parallelogram. And that would be fine. And we could tile the plane with this and we would get this periodic replication of the crosses, wouldn't we? Or we could go to the store and buy this rectangular tile with one cross in the middle, and we could use this rectangular tile, and we could tile the entire plane, and we would get exactly the same result that we got with the, uh, with the parallelogram. 
Dr. Marks? Yes. What would be the uh, periodicity vectors for the tiles on the right? Exactly the same. Don't forget what we want to do is we want to connect, we want to connect the origin here to a different origin. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here we have a connection to the different, we have a connection to the origin and we have a connection to the origin. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's exactly the same. And even over here, we don't even have to have this. We could use P1 being right here as the dashed line and we could have P2 over here. And that, yeah. would, that, that would give us a different parallelogram, but guess what? Its area would be the same as this parallelogram, the same as this rectangle, and it would replicate it. So the tiles are very diverse in terms of your choices of the tiles. Yeah, that makes sense, but this, this, this is kind of what I was confused about, because on the right, the peri periodicity vectors, like they don't really make up the shape of the tile, but that doesn't, that doesn't really matter. No, the periodicity vectors are um, it, it dictate how the center of one period uh, of one periodic tile relates to the center of another one. That's all. Okay. The, the, tile, the tiles that you choose to enforce that duplication is very flexible. Got it. In fact, I think uh, if my memory serves as we go on here, you can see that this is a hexagonal tile that's exactly the, does exactly the same thing here that we have a, um, you know, we get a tile with the cross here in the middle. And uh, we just replicate it all over up and down the, the plane. So the tile, I guess, in a way is it, it, it's constrained by the periodicity vector, but it is not defined by the periodicity vector. And think of, again of going to a tile store. And what you want is you want this periodic replication of all these tiles. You could buy a tile with this parallelogram, go home and lay a million of those, and you would tile your bathroom. You could go and you could get the tile with, you know, with one of these crosses in the middle. You could take this cross, go home. You could tile your bathroom. And guess what? The tiling of using this rectangle is exactly going to be the same as if you use this, um, it, well, as if you use the uh, parallelogram. And that's going to be exactly the same as if you use this hexagon. Your ending tiling of this periodic replication would all be exactly the same, even though you're using different shapes of tiles. So when you're doing the Fourier series, does the tile, I'm just kind of confused how the tile changes the math because you still have the same periodicity vector and the function is still the same no matter what the tile is. Yes, you have to integrate over a tile. Oh, so it changes, oh, it changes the, uh, the bounds of the integral. Yes, it does. Exactly. Okay. So that's the, that's the one thing it changes. Yeah. And okay. it's, it's exactly the same for a one dimensional periodic signal. If you have a one dimensional periodic signal, uh, what period do you integrate over? Can you integrate over this period? Sure. Can you integrate from here to here? Sure. Right. Can you integrate from here to here? Yeah, sure. So it's not, as, it's not as complex for the one-dimensional case, but you can still see that you can integrate over any single period. This generalizes to higher dimensions by integrating over any single tile. And all of a sudden, geometry enters into it, which you don't have in one dimension. Does that make sense? And again, this is kind of weird because you can also do other stuff. You can, do, you can have a tile like this. Uh, th this is really weird. You can have that same rectangular tile, except you put a hole out of it and you put the hole over here. And you will notice that even though this tile is kind of disjoint, you can still use this tile with a hole in it and put the hole over here and use that to fill up the entire plane too. So there's all sorts of cattywampus ways to get a tile.
Okay. So I think you need a little bit more time to work on this. So let's 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 uh, let's come back Thursday and let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about this some more. Let me uh, check out the rest of the homework. I guess the other the the other no the other the other uh, the other questions are not that difficult. So let me go ahead and. Let's go ahead and answer that. I was forgetting what the uh, what the results were. Okay, let's. Um, how about these Fourier transforms? There are a bunch of them in the book, right? And I believe that the answer is in the book, all except for the hexagon. Is that right? They're not in the book. Okay. Okay, unfortunately, I don't have the book. So let's talk about this the next time. Did anybody get the Fourier transform of the hexagon? I worked on it and got an answer. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if it's right. I, I, think I, I think I did a pretty good job, but I don't know. Okay, we'll save that for next time. We'll call on you, Aiden. If, if I don't remember, let me tell you, or let, remind me if you would. Um, and then how about a signal which is known to have a spectrum identically zero outside of an equilateral triangle? Does anybody have a sketch of the, um, of the spectrum that minimizes the sampling rate? I thought that question hadn't been assigned yet, so I didn't try. <laughs> oh, you're right. Okay, we'll assign this for Thursday. This is this is my only sampling theorem question, and so it's pretty uh, pretty straightforward. See, the idea is the idea here is that the idea here is that in the in the frequency domain. If you have the shape of a tile, or if you have a shape of a spectrum, if you have the shape of a spectrum and you want to minimize the sampling rate, you want to figure out how to replicate this spectrum as tightly as you possibly can without overlap. Because the closer you get those spectra together, the bigger the sampling intervals are going to be. So here, I would guess it would might be something like this, right? <laughs> I'm not doing a very good job, am I, gentlemen? Okay, it might be something like this, which kind of uh, maximally packs these things together. I want to maximally pack them in. And because this gives me a periodicity matrix here. And what does this correspond to in the, in the time domain? This corresponds to a Q which is equal to P inverse transpose. And so what you have in this case is you have some sort of Q matrix here. And this Q matrix tells you what the, um, what the sampling intervals here are for Q1 and Q2. So it has the flavor of a sampling, a sampling vectors, but rather that's not the case. It is the geometry that defines the sampling in the time domain. And the density here, do you remember what the density is? It's a determinant of P, your periodicity matrix over here. So we want to minimize the determinant of P. What's the determinant of P? The determinant of P, if you have a P1 and a P2 here, that's going to be the area of a tile, right? 
So the area of a tile translates to the sampling rate over here. And by getting these tiles as close together as possible, you are minimizing the sampling rate or the sampling density. And so that's the one thing I'd like you to get out of the sampling theorem. As I'd like you to get out this idea that the sampling, that the sampling density is related to how tightly you can pack the uh, pack the uh, spectra, and that's a reason we saw, for example, if we had a circular spectra, then um, if you had a circular spectra, then the best you could do is hexagonal, right? Because that's as close as you can pack the circles together. And by the way, this is not only a academic exercise. It does turn out that um, it does turn out that in optics, if you use a spherical lens, a single spherical lens to take an image of something, then your image, if you use monochromatic, coherent, or incoherent light, your image always has a spectrum which is zero outside of a circle. And that circle literally corresponds to the, the pupil, if you will, of the lens, if you use a uh, circular lens. So it's more than an academic exercise. OK, does that help give you some work or some ideas on this? Marks? Yes. Um, back on um, 51B. OK, uh, let's, let, let's go back there, if you will. Um, you had mentioned that like if you use rectangular tiles where like your whole circle wasn't enclosed in one tile that rapidly, or like, I guess finding the equation for a transform of that would be rather challenging. So the easiest po possible way probably would be to have hexagonal tiles. That's right. Um, but I was, how would you represent that kind of tile? Would that be a here, here, Here's what I would do. I would define the periodicity vector, uh, define a hexagon, and define its inverse Fourier transform as a hink. And don't worry about the structure of it. In fact, that's, that's the topic of one of the other problems. So instead of a sink or a jink, you, get a, you, get, you just get a hink. Just call, it, just call it a hink, and that'll be good enough. Okay. Okay, with this in mind, let's uh, let's return to those thrilling days of yesteryear. You guys are too young to remember that. That was, a, that was a theme from the introduction of the Lone Ranger. Let's return to the idea of pox. Let's kind of review where we went. We found out there were a number of convex sets and there were a number of classes of signals which were convex. These included bounded energy, uh, signals that integrated to a specific area, say an area of two, we found out that signals which have identical middles for a, form a convex set. We found out that the, that the set of all band-limited signals forms a convex set. And so we have a number of these uh, convex sets that we have defined. We also went through before and, um, and looked at the projection on all of these convex sets. Then we found out that the intersection between two convex sets is also a convex set. And that alternate, and here's the main result, that alternating projection among different convex sets always converges to a fixed point in the intersection of those two sets. Do you remember that? So here we have the convex set, which is just a line. We have this oval sort of thing. The line intersects the oval in this little line segment here. And if we start here, we go boom, 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 project, 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 project. And eventually, we're going to work ourselves down to this fixed point. 
and this is kind of cool. No, it's not. It's more than kind of cool. It's very cool. Um, is there a uh, guarantee that it will take a finite number of uh, alternating projections to get to the? No, no. In fact, it could be an infinite number. But what's going to happen is that uh, in, um, in cases, for example, if you have two linear manifolds, it turns out that your step size can be shown to decrease all the time. And so you just get to a step size where you do an iteration and you don't uh, change that much. You're probably close enough. That's a good engineering application for, for everything, right? And again, it depends on your point of initialization. If we were to start the initialization down here, we would project onto the line segment, we would project onto the oval, and we would be home here. And, um, and that converges also to a point on the intersection, but it converges to a different point. If we started internal to the oval, we would converge in a single iteration, wouldn't we? Because we would project onto this line and we would be home. We would be in a point that was common to both sets. In other words, to the intersection. Let me give you an example. I'm going to choose two convex sets. We want a set, first of all, that's bounded. And we're going to just talk about signals that are bounded between 0 and 4. And do you remember what to do if we got a signal that was not bounded? We just clipped it. If it was below minus 1, we set it to 0. If it was above 4, we set it to 4. We just clipped it on the top and the bottom. The other thing that we would like to do is we would like to have the area, the sum of the three points, be equal to 2. Now, this is the, these are two convex sets. These are two convex sets. Uh, now, this one, if you remember, the, it was the water level raising or the water level lowering. So you took the whole signal and you either pushed it up or pulled it down until it had the desired area. So let's go ahead and start with this result. Now, notice this first signal is not bounded, isn't it? it, it in fact, all of its signals lie outside of the bound from 0 to 4. So let's bound it. Again, we're going to take this signal, bound it here. We're going to take these signals, and we're going to bound it at the top points here, giving us this signal, right? So we've projected onto the set of bounded signals as we have defined them, between 0 and 4. So that's one of the projections. The next thing to do is to project on the second convex set, where the three elements add up to 2. And to do this, we take these three, these three points and we lower them or raise them so that the total sum is equal to 2. So that's what we're going to do. And when we do this, we get this result. We take this thing and we lower it down by a value of 2 to get this result. Can you see this is exactly the same as this signal, except we have taken it and lowered the water level down by a value of 2 to get this result. So this is all this is all well and good. Okay, now so we've we've projected onto one convex set, we're projecting onto another convex set. Now we want to project back onto bounded signals where this thing isn't bounded anymore, is it? Because it has a value of minus two here. When we lower the water level, that middle point dipped below the surface, and we're not allowed to go below the surface since our lower bound is equal to zero. So we're going to bound it. We're going to take this point, which lies outside of the bound, and we're going to clip it to zero, aren't we? We're going to take this point, and we're going to clip it to zero. OK, that's all well and good. Now we want to add this. We want to have this result add to 2. How do we do that? Well, it doesn't add to 2. It adds to 4, right? 2 plus 0 plus 2 is equal to 4. So we want to lower the water level here so that it only adds up to 2. And to do this, we get to what? 1 and a third 
one and a third and minus two thirds. So it turns out if you take these three numbers and you add them together, guess what you get? You get two. So this is exactly the signal, except now we have, we have lowered it a little bit in order to give it a area of two. The next thing we would like to do is we would like to bound it again. And we notice that this thing is dipped below the water level. So we need to bound this to two or bound it to zero. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this, this signal, and we're going to stick it here at zero, which is exactly what we have here, right? So we have one and a third, one and a third, and uh, zero. Now this doesn't add up to two. It adds up to a little bit more than two, doesn't it? It adds up to two and two thirds. But notice we're getting closer. Up here they added to eight. Here they added to uh, four. Here they're adding to one and two thirds. So you see it's getting closer and closer and closer, right? Here we have four plus four, which is eight. Here we have two plus two, which is four. And here we have one and a third and one of the third, which is what, two and two thirds? So it's getting closer, it's getting closer and closer to two, isn't it? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna lower the water level again. And if we keep on doing this, we lower the water level and then clip, lower the water level and clip, you can see what it converges to. It will converge to this signal, which is one, zero, one. So this signal is bounded. This signal is bounded because it, it lies within this interval. And the sum of the three numbers add up to two. And as David said, this doesn't happen in a finite number of steps. You're going to get closer and closer and closer. You're going to get from uh, eight to uh, four to uh, two and two thirds. And then you'll get a little bit smaller. You'll get a bit, little bit closer to two. And then eventually, it adds up to two. So that's an example of pox. And it takes, yes, a very large number of, of, um, of iterations in order to converge. But it does indeed converge. This is uh, hopefully kind of an intuitive example of a very elementary problem in pox. It's a toy problem. Bounded signals that the area sums to equal to two. And I think you can see by looking at this in detail that we can see the convergence happening, right? We can see the convergence happening. Any questions at all? Okay. Okay, lemma one, these are some lemmas. Alternating projection among n convex sets with a non-empty intersection will converge to a point common to all. What we've looked at thus far is just two convex sets, haven't we? But say we have three convex sets, and these convex sets have a non-empty intersection, then Pox will always converge to a point of the non-empty intersection. Here we have three convex sets. C1, C2, which is a line, and then C, th C sub 3. I don't know what that is, but that's some sort of convex set. And we're going to assume that they have a single intersection. A single intersection. If we have a single intersection, then, well, that's the point that everything converges to. If there's a single point of intersection, no matter where you start, you're going to end up at that single point of intersection. So we start here. We project onto C1, then we project onto C2, project onto C3, project onto C1 again, then project onto C2, then we project on, we don't have to project here onto C2 anymore because we're already in C2, right? This point is within C2 already. So if you recall, if a point is internal to the convex set and we project, that point doesn't move at all. So we project onto C2, doesn't change at all, project onto C3. Then back to C1, project onto C2, C2 again, it's already in C2, so we won't move at all. And so we go back to C3, and you can see that as if we continue on, we will approach this result. 
And this is going to be independent of where you start. It doesn't matter where you start, you're going to converge to the same result. For example, if we start down here, and we uh, project it onto C1, first of all, here's the projection onto C1. Then we project it onto C2. Then we project it onto C3. And you can see we get in this example of geometry, we converge very, very quickly. So hopefully this is a, a nice geometrical explanation and understanding of the way the pox works. This is lemma one. Lemma one again is that alternating projection onto convex sets among n convex sets with a non-empty intersection will converge to a point common to all. And this is a very useful result. John von Neumann is maybe one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century. He had a bunch of stuff named after him. I th one of the things I found out, he was one of the first people to recognize the importance of Gödel's proof when he went to see the young man, the young little nerd from Austria present his result at a conference. And he was very impressed with it and uh, was one of the few people that actually understood it. Uh, he's done a lot of, he's, done a lot of interesting stuff. But von Neumann had something called von Neumann's alternating projection algorithm. And this is useful, believe it or not, in inversion of matrices, which we might get to. If you have two, two planes, now here we have a two-dimensional plane in a three-dimensional space. We could have a 50-dimensional plane in a, in a 50 dimensional space or in 50 dimensional plane and 100 dimensional space and it would still apply. What von Neumann's alternating projection algorithm was was a special case of pox for where your two convex sets were planes. And we saw in our case that we have a number of different uh, cases of, of planes. So if you have a point here external to the planes Notice that this point and the two planes here uh, correspond to this kind of white triangle. This white triangle, which is perpendicular, this white triangle is perpendicular to both the C1 and the C2 side. It's perpendicular to both sides, right? It cuts it at 90 degrees. And this plane, if we continue it on, has this point which this white triangle cuts in, and you will always converge according to von Neumann's alternating projection theorem to this point uh, defined by C1, C2, and your initialization. To show this, well, I'm just, I'm just re, re, <laughs> this is a redrawing of what I tried to draw before. You get to the closest point to the intersection to Y. Uh, to, to, so to see that, notice that we have this result here. We have Y, which projects onto C1, which then projects onto C2. And notice that all of these projections lie on this white triangle plane, don't they? Because they're all, all orthogonal, right? And this projects here, and it projects here. And you can see that we're going to get to the closest point to the intersection to Y. So again, this is a special case of pox. Here's lemma two, and we'll present this and then probably elaborate it on a next time. What if your convex sets don't intersect and you have two convex sets? Those of us involved in design notice that often we have design criteria. Now these design criteria in this case can correspond to, well, we want a solution in C1, well, we want a solution in C2. We often know that we can't get solutions in C1 and C2 at the same time, and therefore have to go to a design trade-off between C1 and C2. So there exists no signal that is common to both C1 and C2. What happens to pox here? 
Well, there's an interesting result here in that if you have two convex sets, there is a point in C1 that is closest to all of the points in C2. This is the point in C1 that is closest to all the points in C2. There's no point, there, there's, uh, and, and this, is, this, is the, this is the closest point in C2. No matter what other value you choose in C2, uh, it's going to be a bigger distance, isn't it? No matter what point you choose in C2. This is the point where this C1 is closest to C2 and C2 is closest to C1. And so these are probably the best compromise that you can get if you require C2 and you want to get C1 as best you can, well, you're probably going to choose this value of C1. Why? Because it's the closest point into C2. And here's the interesting thing about pox among two uh, non-intersecting convex sets. You will always converge to a limit cycle back and forth between these two points, no matter where you start. If you start down here, whoop, 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 you go back and forth. So you're always going to converge to a so-called limit cycle. I believe that's on the next slide. No, there it is. You're going to converge to a limit cycle. In other words, your pox is going to break into an oscillation. And you're going to get a steady state oscillation where you go back and forth and you're projecting from C1 to C2 and then back to C1, then back to C2, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's, that's pox. Uh, we have lemma one, which extends pox to more than two convex sets. And then we have, um, and then we have this other lemma that if two convex sets don't intersect, you do break into a limit cycle where one point is closest to another one. It turns out that if you have three or more convex sets, well, you got some problems and we'll probably start there next time. So with that, are there any are there any questions at all? It's kind of cool, isn't it? This is really, really cool stuff. And, and it has so many applications that I think you're going to be interested in. I've heard the idea of pox referred to as whack-a-mole. I don't know if you've ever played whack-a-mole, where you have this arcade game where this mole sticks his head up and you slam it with a hammer and then another mole head pops up and you try to slam it with a hammer this is this is what is happening in pox you're trying to meet the constraint in c1 so whack you make it you make it satisfy c1 by projecting onto the convex set the first convex set but guess what when you whack this down c2 pops up doesn't it so you gotta whack this one down well when this one whacks down gets whacked down the other one kind of pops up so you whack this one and this one pops up and the result of pox is that if you keep playing whack-a-mole long enough you're going to get both of the moles uh, satisfied and in the ground so you don't have to whack them anymore and it's a very intuitive way of doing things any questions at all Okay, we'll look at some uh, interesting applications uh, next time how many more times do we have to meet Two more times, okay. Two more times, okay. We will see you if there's no if there's no questions. Thank you all for listening. Be of good cheer. Oh, do you have a question, Glauco, or were you waving goodbye? Uh, Adam, Adam is saying, Adam is saying that we have three more times. Maybe one, yeah. After Thanksgiving, we still have one. Yeah. Okay. After Thanksgiving, we still have one. I yeah, believe have... that after Thanksgiving. Okay, so we do we do have one more. Okay. Yeah, because we have Thursday next.